Welcome everybody. I'm John Quiggan. I'm a Professor of Economics at the University of Queensland. I'll be moderating this 2022 Economics Thought Leadership Seminar on the question, is it time for a four-day week? I'd like to start today by acknowledging the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. On behalf of the University of Queensland, I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. We'll have noticed closed captions, closed captioning enabled to make this webinar more accessible to all viewers. If you would like to turn these on or off, you can do so by clicking the live transcripts button below and following the prompts. If you have any questions today throughout the web webinar, please submit these to Q&A and these will be addressed during the Q&A part of today's webinar. Uh, we've got a great panel here today and I'd like to introduce the panellists. Uh, Charlotte Lockhart is a business advocate, investor and philanthropist with more than 25 years experience in multiple industries locally and overseas. As founder and managing director for the four day week global campaign, she works internationally promoting the benefits of a productivity focused and reduced hour workplace. Through this, she is on the board of the Wellbeing Research Centre at Oxford University and the advisory boards of the US campaign and the Ireland campaign for the four day week. Professor John Buchanan is currently co-director of the Mental Wealth Initiative and a professor in the Business Information Systems Discipline at the University of Sydney Business School. His key domain of expertise is labour market restructuring and its implications for skills and education. This research involves, among other things, using data science in conjunction with qualitative methods to generate new scholarly and policy relevant knowledge. His current major research interest is the future of expertise and social solidarity in a world of mass underemployment and artificial intelligence. Uh, finally, Emma Dawson is the executive director of the per capita think tank. She has worked as a researcher at Monash University and the University of Melbourne in policy and public affairs for SBS and Telstra and as a senior policy advisor in the Rudd and Gillard governments. Emma has published reports, articles and opinion pieces on a wide range of public policy issues. She's a regular contributor to The Guardian Australia, The Age, Independent Australia and the Australian Financial Review and a frequent guest on various ABC and commercial radio programs nationally. She appears regularly as an expert witness before parliamentary inquiries and often speaks at public events and conferences in Australia and internationally. Uh, so I'm uh, very pleased to be talking about uh, this, uh, to be moderating uh, this uh, webinar, which is on, on a topic uh, close to my heart, and I have a few minutes to uh, uh, set the background. So the question, is it time for a, a four day week? Uh, I'll start with some history. Uh, in the mid 19th century, uh, workers worked six days a week, every day except Sunday, uh, and for 10 to 12 hours a day quite frequently. Uh, in the middle of the 19th century, Australian and New Zealand workers were the first to get uh, an eight hour working day. Uh, stonemasons in Melbourne claim the honour, but as usual in these things, New Zealanders say they got there first and uh, they may well be right. Um, but uh, uh, that was an, uh, therefore an eight hour, six day week, 48 hours a week. Uh, by the turn of the uh, 20th century, uh, we'd managed to get Saturday afternoons off, uh, so a 44 hour week. Uh, but the weekend, something which most of us think of as more or less uh, permanent and immutable, uh, was only achieved uh, after World War II. It's about 75 years old. Uh, so those advances are about 50 years apart. Uh, it's now 75 years since we've had any reduction in the number of uh, days in the standard working, hour, standard working week, and nearly 40 years since we've had any significant reduction at all in standard working hours. During that time, of course, uh, uh, technology has revolutionised their lives, productive capacity has increased greatly, uh, real wages have risen a great deal, profits uh, even more. Uh, so we're certainly well and truly in a position where we can make, in my view, uh, big advances in achieving a balance between paid work uh, and all the other work uh, in our lives, uh, dealing with our families, our relationships and so forth. I think uh, the other reason why this is a particularly appropriate time is that we've seen uh, as <coughs> events, particularly the pandemic, have upended our lives in so many ways, that just because work has been organised in one particular way for a very long time, uh, doesn't mean uh, it has to be that way. I think uh, uh, many people would have thought unthinkable that uh, we could all be sent home with very little notice 
and um, that uh, those of us with office jobs could manage to carry on uh, more or less uh, uh, as if nothing had happened, despite in many cases being uh, also forced to take responsibility for, for our children uh, undertaking, undertaking remote study. Uh, so that's indicated, I think, uh, a willingness uh, a willingness uh, to look at other things and a demand on the part of, of many employees uh, to get away from uh, the rigid regimentation of a uh, fixed 38 hour week, uh, clocking on, clocking off and so forth. And so um, we've also seen, um, also seen a significant uh, reduction in real wages over the, um, over the, uh, a period uh, since the pan since the pandemic lockdowns ended, uh, and very great resistance on the part of of policymakers uh, to rapidly regaining that. So one possible way of of restoring workers' position uh, will be a significant reduction in working hours uh, in lieu of uh, the wage increases, which in many respects are overdue. Uh, those kinds of issues need to be uh, need to be debated, I think, at length. But we're certainly seeing. Uh, with the experiments that are taking place, considerable progress and evidence that uh, we can be, uh, in some cases, as productive in four days as, as we were in five. Uh, certainly, that uh, we're not looking at anything like a twenty percent reduction in in output. If we can get our work into four days and work more efficiently in those days, make better use of the of the time that's available to us. Uh, so, with that, I'll introduce our first speaker, uh, uh, Charlotte Lockhart. And over to you, Charlotte. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'll just quickly share my screen. I've not got a, a lot of slides, but just a little bit of uh, um, stuff about me. Um, oh, that's there we go. Um, so we um, at Four Day Week Global, who, who, who are we? We so we're basically a an organisation that Andrew Barnes and I set up um, back in early two thousand and nineteen because we we had run a very successful pilot of a four-day week in our business perpetual guardian in new zealand and, and, you, and you're probably all, all aware of that um and we set up four-day week global realistically because there was just so much conversation that needed to 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 is kind of really have an umbrella to, to fall that together. So what we've ended up with is an organization that lobbies governments and other agencies, but mainly supports businesses and local initiatives um, so that we can continue to have the conversation around how we might reduce work time. Now we call ourselves Four Day Week Global, but um, you know a number of people that run on our pilots or businesses that we that we coach. Uh, do some other form of reduced hour working, whether that be a 32 hour work week or a 30, 30 hour work week over five or seven days and, and, and just adjusting shift patterns. Because it's there is clear evidence that, uh, that actually having a whole day off is actually very good for our people and is going to be good for our society. But you know the, the journey for us being able to get to a point where there is legislative change that puts that in a, meaning, in a meaningful way is probably a little way away. And so what the role we see uh, that we have is to actually be having those conversations and um, getting companies to pilot and practice uh, how they can reduce time. We've got our fabulous academics that uh, we work alongside around, around the world, including the two Johns, um, and actually getting that data together. Um, and, and as we study every, com com every company, we're starting to, you know, while that's micro data for those companies, we're starting to find a macro conversation. Now, most of the companies that are on the four day week uh, program um, are doing it now because of um, they want to attract and retain the best staff. And that's, I think, one of the big things that we're all facing in the current um, tight um, uh, market for, 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 for staff. That's also, of course, reflective of an economic cycle that we're in at the moment. And if we do slide into a recession or when the economic times change and unemployment goes up, of course, that shift will, will, will go. Um, but it is recognising that post-pandemic, our, our, our employees are 
requiring us to consult them more around what our workplace will look like. And this is where we get the quietly quitting and the great resignations and things. But realistically, you know, as much as we spend so much of our time talking about how you improve productivity, and we have a thing called the 100-80-100 rule, 100% pay, 80% time, as long as there is 100% output or productivity. Um, and so that's the principle that we work on. We actually, as a community and as a society, need to look at where does work sit in our society? And I, and I say to business leaders, and, and, and I say to, to you here, that as, as employers, we need to remember that we borrow our people from their lives. And the, the, where we've put work in the latter part of the 20th, 20th century and certainly into the 21st century, so as much as the young ones have defined great resignation and quietly quitting, all of which existed previously, they've just given it a name, my generation, the generation um, of, of, of generation, I'm, I'm an exer and, you know, and, and there's plenty of boomers around, we invented burnout. And actually the damage that we are doing to our health and our families and our planet and the way that our society runs um, actually really needs to be looked at. So this isn't just about how we reduce work time, how we increase productivity, how we protect pay, but actually it's a, it's a question for us around what is the society that we want to take forward into the 21st century. As uh, humans, we, we, we always want our children to have better than we did, and that's been through, the, through, through time. Um, and, but in the 21st century, all we're offering our children is more. You know, we're having more housing, more food, hello, obesity epidemic, um, more education, more, just more, more, more. And actually, the only thing that the young ones really want more of is time. And what are we going to do with that time? So the research that we are conducting actually has very interesting things about what people do with the time when we give them extra time off. But if we look at some of the fundamental things that we are losing because we are not, we are working so hard. So we're losing our health, both physical and mental. We are losing uh, our planet. Uh, we are losing, uh, we're not winning the game on gender. Uh, that we are we have stuck where we are. We've done so much to pull women up, but we're not doing enough to let men out of the workforce. Um, but we're also not giving our, ourselves time to engage in our communities. And I use an example um, all of the time around around Rotary. So Rotary is an organisation that is struggling to get members to join their their meetings and it's and it's really becoming a, a a big problem for them but look at what rotary did and i mean they they do so many wonderful things but rotary cured polio so that, their reach around the world was so significant that they cured a disease that was killing and and disabling people in large numbers and so we as a society need to decide that actually there's a place for work, but that actually what we need to be working on additionally is our relationships, our communities, um, and, and our health, and working on how we're gonna solve the, the conundrum of, of environmental, um, of climate change. So I challenge you all to think about how work sits in your own lives and in the lives of those that you influence and actually think to yourself, is the amount that I am working, is the amount that I, the people around me are, are working actually disproportional to the, what I might be able to do with my time? And what we see from the research is that people can be as productive in less time, whether it's a four-day week or a 32-hour week. So we, can, we won't necessarily damage our economy, but then we need to imagine all of the things that we will get when we leap and take that change. And so it, it, I find it just fascinating that we're, we are actually still asking the question, you know, 75 years ago is when we started truly having a 40 hour week. And with all of the advancements that we've had in um, technology, there is no reason why we are still 
uh, working those long hours. And we should actually be starting to value it. But also, if you think back to a time when we started working a 40 hour week, our society was constructed quite differently. Generally, it was just dad that went to work. And when he came home, he was available for the family and family meals were had together, weekends were had together and holidays were had together, not worrying about whether there's Wi-Fi for anybody to be able to plug into. And even though back in those days, we didn't have as many annual holiday days available to us, they were more about being able to disconnect from work in a way that just isn't available to so many people that, uh, now. And so we are damaging ourselves, we're damaging our families, and we are damaging our planet and our society. So we need to, we need to have an honest conversation with ourselves around how we solve all of that. And, and, the, and reducing work time is only one of those things, but it's a large contributor that will free the time up for people to then start tackling it for themselves. You know, often when uh, when companies uh, are doing this, I, I recommend to them that they that they encourage their pe their people to come to work with the stories of what they have done. Don't you know? Don't dictate to them what they can do on their time off, but encourage them to bring and share with the others what they are achieving with that. And as a society, we will be able to achieve so much more. And, you know, and back to the young ones, you know, they uh, leave school knowing that what they have learned in school will be, in, you know, won't be useful within about five minutes of them walking out the school gates. And so they will need to continuously educate themselves. They will need to be on a continuum for that. And so when are we going to let them do that? As our population ages, um, you know, when are we going to have time to be caring for our, our aging parents? And then, I, you know, just some of the most beautiful stories that come out of the four-day week are around parents being able to spend more time with their children. I have one, one chap who walks his daughter, he works 32 hours over five days and walks his daughter to school every day. And so he's creating a very different life for himself and for his daughter and for his wife, for that matter. And so these are the things that we need to be taking into consideration. And we have an opportunity with business leaders, leaders truly looking at how they can reform work and what is our the future of work strategies that they were all looking at before the pandemic. It is here and now. And so... I feel we should honour those who lost their health and lost their lives through the pandemic by reforming how we work and how we engage with work and leading a better life. So I, uh, yeah, we'll leave it there. And back to you, John. Uh, thanks very much, Charlotte. Uh, our next speaker is John Buchanan. Thanks, John, and uh, thanks, Charlotte, uh, for opening these uh, deliberations, and thanks to the University of Queensland for inviting me today. I think these kind of events are terrific, and um, I think this is a really important topic. So that the question is, is it time for a four-day work week? Uh, my answer is yes. It's been time for about the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, in fact, I've been working in working time research on and off for about the last 30 years. And in answering the question, is it time for it? I think it's worth remembering that in Australia, we have one of the most fragmented working time regimes anywhere within the OECD. We've got one of the highest proportions of part-time workers, but amongst those, we've got a huge amount of involuntary part-time work. And amongst full-timers, we work amongst the longest hours anywhere within the OECD. So trying to get some notion of working time standards clarified is, is very difficult. And I think having the idea of putting a norm of four days out there instead of five is helpful. Norms are still important, even though we've had a neoliberal assault on labour standards for the best part of 30 years now. Um, the, that norm is still sitting there. And I think having a reference point for setting standards is important. So I was asked to answer three questions. How is the experience of, uh, how's the experiment of the four-day work week going? And I'll give you a quick update on that. 
Second question is, would Australian workers choose to do it? And then thirdly, how would it work in a 24-7 economy? So first question, how's the experiment progressing? Well, I'd have to say it's, it's, uh, it's an exciting uh, development. It, you, the, it's got huge traction in terms of media coverage. Uh, the, the journalists are really doing their best to get this argument out there that the way in which we carve up the work week needs to be rethought. Charlotte and her, her colleagues have done a terrific job in actually opening up new lines of questioning and debate, and the, the journalists have been there supporting them. On the ground, the situation is patchy but inspiring. So Charlotte was one of the, the kind of pioneers in the, uh, you know, over the last 10 years with her work at Perpetual Gardening, Guardian, so Perpetual Guardian. But there are now initiatives underway with experiments involving 30 to 40 companies, at least in countries as diverse as Ireland, the US, the UK, Australia and New Zealand. And at country level, there are movements in Belgium, Spain, Scotland and uh, um, Iceland. In fact, in Iceland, there's 1% of the population actually working to this regime. So how's the experiment progressing? I'd say exceptionally well. Getting change in working time on a coordinated basis is a hard thing to do. And the fact that, that these uh, initiatives are mushrooming is inspiring. So my second question, would Australian workers choose it? Well, having done a lot of working time research, I've been involved with a lot of debates, particularly with conservative economists who say people choose the hours of work they want because they're free agents. And I find that a particularly unhelpful way of thinking about working time, because if you look at how working time evolves over um, the centuries, people don't wake up one morning and decide they want to work shorter hours and then work those shorter hours. They make those decisions within a social context. And working time falls where there's uh, a collective push to bring it down. And so, as John mentioned at the beginning, Australia and New Zealand have been at the forefront of this in the past. Like we led the achievement of the eight hour day in the middle of the 19th century. Then in the middle of the 20th century, we led the way in getting the 40 hour week. It's not often, not commonly recognised amongst Australians, but Australia was, regard Australia was the Sweden of its day. You know, everyone says we should look at what Sweden, Norway, Denmark do. Europeans used to come out to Australia in the late 19th century. The whole delegations came out from Europe at the end of the Second World War to find out why the sky hadn't fallen in because we had a 40 hour week. We lost that tradition. Um, and it wasn't a matter of individual workers losing uh, the, the interest. We've had structural shifts, which have meant that uh, workers are now making constrained choices because we've worked in, in a situation of rising inequality and that means often part-timers are scratching to get enough hours and full-timers uh, are locked in often to high debt situations which require high hours of work. So the answer to the question, would workers choose it? Yes, they would if the collective structures were there to make that choice easier. We currently lack those collective structures, but um, we can't magically conjure up you know, a union campaign or state legislation. You've got to start somewhere and that's why I think the, the four-day workweek experiments are so important because they are offering a pathfinder role. In any area of um, social change, you've got to have people who try out things and sometimes fail. You know, let's, let's not be afraid of that. But from experiments, you find workable solutions. And so that leads then to my third question, how would it work in a 24-7 economy? And it is true that the working time challenge today is quite different to what it was uh, in the 19th century or the middle of the, the 20th century. But that's, that's not nothing to be fearful about. I mean, chimes change and we have to figure out new ways of developing standards appropriate to them. And how would it work in a 24-7 economy? In a nutshell, we've really got to get down to the nuts and bolts of how we organise rosters. It might sound mundane, but I've been a labour market researcher for 35 years and some of the most interesting work I've seen at workplace level is how people ration their time within work groups. This is not a, a, a problem of Einsteinian proportions. You know, groups of people can get together and figure out how they can reconfigure their hours to get both good service and, and product produced 
but also do in a way that's socially sustainable. And also making it work in a 24-7 economy related to the question of rosters is the whole issue of work sharing. And the, the French did this at a national level with their working time reforms and the German engineering sector did it in the late 1980s and early 1990s with their 36 hour uh, initiative. So there's huge experimentation at sectoral and national level which shows how you can reconfigure working time in ways that are economically sustainable. Interestingly, in Australia, the Electrical Trades Union and the uh, CFMEU had very interesting experiments with the 36 hour work week uh, in Victoria. Uh, they actually shut the whole industry down for a, a day a month to enforce uh, shorter working weeks. And that required that allocation of hours, required, reallocation of hours, required them to think about how they increased training rates. Because as you, as you bring hours down for some workers, the work's still there. So they improved their apprenticeship numbers and they brought in underemployed older workers. So working time reform has all sorts of positive spin offs that I think can make the 24 7 society function better, but in a more civilized way. So, how are we to conclude? I think enterprise level experimentation is important and necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, I would say we're at the early stages of a, a new way of thinking about working time. The four day work week is a great reference point for, for starting. But I think if we're to go further, we've got to look at how we engage with unions, other progressive organisations, particularly environmentalists and those covering disadvantaged workers who are currently locked out of the labour market. We've got to look at employers, they often um, dragging their heels in this uh, area. But most importantly, in, in Australia, we've got to talk to state governments. If you look at how working time in Australia has come down, you've find, seen standards set in particular enterprises and particular sectors, and then it's generalised either through <coughs> uh, industrial awards, but most importantly, through state government legal, level legislation. So thanks for giving me 10 minutes to talk, and I think I've done it within time, John. Uh, yes, you have. Well done. Uh, so now over to Emma. Thank you, John, and it's lovely to be with all of you today uh, coming to you here from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, yes, it's a long past time for a four day week. Uh, when I began talking about a four day week, advocating for the idea of reduced working hours uh, some years ago now, I was told it was a radical concept, uh, to which my standard in stock response became, well, at one point, so was the weekend, uh, so was the eight hour day, uh, so was actually child labour laws. So just because something is considered radical, it always is before its time has arrived. Um, why am I particularly interested and passionate about the four day week? Well, it's a, it's a working rights issue, but it's also from my own research on women's economic uh, security and well-being, the game changer, the one thing that I believe can genuinely make a difference to the cultural uh, practices that are so embedded in our society and our economy, and that is the burden burden in economic terms of unpaid work and care that falls disproportionately on women's shoulders. Um, so to put that in a little bit of context, um, it's almost 100 years now, 92 years since John Maynard Keynes predicted that by the time his grandchildren came of age, uh, labour productivity and, and labour saving technology would have progressed to the point at which we were all working a 15 hour week. Uh, how wrong he was. In fact, by household, we're working more hours than ever. Um, when Australia first published its labour force statistics in 1978, uh, women made up about 35% of the workforce. Today, they're just under half that workforce. So many, many more women are in the paid labour force than were when I was a child. Uh, and yet most of them are working part-time, about 45, well, just under half of women in the workforce work part-time. And of course, when women have children, that number jumps exponentially. Australia has amongst the highest rates of part-time work amongst women in the OECD. And we have a particularly sticky model of the neoclassical household maker.
makeup where a man works full time and a woman works part time. Uh, the old chant of those advocating for an eight hour day used to be eight hours for labour, eight hours for recreation and eight hours for rest or eight hours work, eight hours play, eight hours sleep. Uh, women are not getting eight hours play. They are not getting eight hours recreation because as they've moved into the paid labour force, there's still all of that work that needs to be done at home. Uh, by reducing the expectations around what is a standard full-time working week for all people, we can actually restore or, or fix up some of that balance of the unpaid work that can take some of that pressure off women and allow them to participate more in the labour force, in the paid labour force or in society in ways that they choose to outside the home. But we can also give men the great benefit and, and gift of spending more time with children, of contributing more to the non-material production uh, aspects of their household. Um, and the critical thing about the move to a four day week and the international campaign for a four day week is, as Charlotte said, that 100 80 100 outcome. So 100% of the income, 100% of the output, but 80% of the time. And some of the concerns you hear about that sometimes from people is, well, how will I possibly do five days worth of work in four days? Um, but actually, a major study in the UK a few years ago that surveyed around 2,000 office workers found that they were only really productive for two hours and 53 minutes a day, even when they were in that office for eight hours. So there is a lot that can be achieved by working smarter rather than working longer hours. And if we can take some of that time back to our own homes and our families, we can make a real shift in the way that gender roles play out in society. Um, I think the critical thing to recognise here is that in that almost century since Keynes made his prediction, labour productivity has increased as he suggested it would. Technology has reduced uh, the reliance on working hours and we can now produce in a day what it used to take our grandparents the best part of a month uh, to produce in terms of labour output or even more. Uh, and yet working people, the, the workers, the cogs in the machine have not seen that translate into an equivalent share of that productivity going to them in wages or in wealth. Uh, and what the four-day week can do is say, well, we won't lose any productivity. It won't cost businesses any more in wage costs, but we will be returning a fifth of your time to you. And that's incredibly valuable for families, not just for all the immaterial concerns that Charlotte outlined around, uh, around health and well-being, uh, but around the value of that unpaid work that's done in the home. Uh, the eight hours labour that used to be uh, done by men uh, uh, a century ago when they would come home and, and kick off their eight hours recreation, that was only possible because there was somebody working in the home doing all of that eight hours of labour to prepare meals and keep things clean and wash the clothes and get the food in and care for the children. Uh, so what per capita is involved in at the moment as part of this four day week trial is we're actually applying a gender lens to a company that is involved in the trial here in Melbourne, our community, and I'm actually in our community's building to talk to you today. Um, um, and we have done an initial survey of uh, participants in the trial here uh, to, to try to break down what the impact would be on those gender roles in the home. And we currently have around 60 employees here completing a time use diary that will show us in granular detail just what they're doing with the extra time they have not in the office. Um, but initial survey results, and you're always a little nervous when you go into something with uh, a strong belief that it will have certain outcomes, but I'm very, very relieved to tell you that the initial results of that survey that we've done show a significant impact on men, on the way men are using their time at home. So over two thirds of the men surveyed have said they're spending considerably more time caring for their own children and around half the participants in the survey do have dependent children and live in couple relationships. So over two thirds have said they're spending more time caring for their children um, and it, critically uh, around a third of them have said that their partner who is not employed by this business but is the primary, uh, so primary carer for children for dependent children have been able to take more time for themselves. Um, in a couple of cases, we've seen partners return to the workforce or return to study that they were unable to do previously. We've also seen a decline in sick leave of, of around 37% uh, by, by participants in the trial. Um, and we've seen a real impact on, on men on how they're using 
using that time at home, saying that they believe they are doing more, uh, more care for children, and that the, the costs of childcare um, have come down for, um, for men, uh, have come down for women, um, because they're able to spend more time at home as well. Once we get the time use diary back, we'll be able to look into in quite granular detail what activities uh, people are doing and I I using that extra time for um, and how that will have a greater, uh, we hope, longer term impact on, the, on, on fixing that imbalance between um, men, heterosexual couple relationships of cis men and cis women uh, and the sharing or lack thereof that they do of domestic work. Uh, because one thing that we do know that researchers in this field know is that even as women have entered the workforce and even when they are the primary or main breadwinner in their household, they still take on more of that unpaid work, the mental load and the care load uh, in their own, in their own uh, households. Uh, so I am firmly of the view and the early findings from our study would seem to back it up, uh, that this is not just a game changer for workers across the board, but could have a profound impact on the way that we organise our personal relationships and our lives at home. Um, and the long term impact of this is quite significant for women, because we know that women taking time out of the workforce to care for children, or, or going back to work part time to accommodate that unpaid work is one of the primary drivers of economic inequality across the life course. It's one of the major reasons for the gender pay gap around the world. It is one of the major causes of women's uh, relative income poverty in retirement because they're less able to save for their retirements than are men. Um, and it has significant impacts on women's health and well-being across the life course as well. Um, but it's not just a great benefit for women. What we're seeing and what the pandemic showed us is that that forced shift in the way that we were meant to work and the way that we had to work during the pandemic revealed to a whole generation of men that actually there's a lot to be gained from spending more time at home, from being more actively involved with your children, from being, even if you're not uh, the parent of a dependent child, more actively involved in the running of your household and in spending time on those relationships outside of work. So we are, uh, we'll be continuing our assessment of this particular part of the trial over the coming few months uh, and, and are looking forward to those results from the Time Use Diary coming out uh, because that will allow us to challenge some of the perceptions people have with the facts of how they're actually using that time. Uh, but in conclusion, because I can see my time is ticking on, um, I would simply say that uh, the model for the four day week or the reduced working hours week um, that is being pushed and promoted by this trial is becoming something now that is no longer, I'm no longer greeted with that's a radical concept. People have heard of it, they're interested in it, um, and they're more and more aware of the benefits. Uh, and I would close by saying uh, that if we do want to recoup some of those productivity gains that we've seen emerge over the last 92 years uh, and that have primarily gone into profitability, uh, uh, if we want to recoup some of that time and leave a lighter footprint on the planet as well, the four day week is one of the best steps we can take to create a more equal, a more sustainable and a more enjoyable economy and society. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, um, Emma and all the participants. Here we go. Um, so it's uh, we've got um, everybody stuck very well to time. We have uh, 20 minutes uh, for uh, Q and A, um, and so um, I think um, the simplest would be for people to put their hand up, and um, then, then we should be able to click on them. I think uh, is uh, uh, alternatively we've been answering the questions in, in typed in Q and A as they go. So, um, does anybody would anybody like to kick things off with a with a question? Always the moment when we wait for somebody to be brave. Um, okay, so we have we have a question which I think um, uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, John could talk about. Certainly, I can. Otherwise, uh, from Louise, I can see wages being kept even for salary is paid. Most part time work is paid hourly. How will this work? So, I'm guessing John's probably closest to this one. But um, well, I think. <clears throat> there's not a uh, there's not a, a standard form in response to this. I think that's that's what I was trying to get at with Australia having a very fragmented mm. hours of work regime. So you, and <clears throat> you cannot. It's very hard to specify 
economy-wide how you would solve that problem. I think what we've got to do is work at a higher order and actually say, and it's what uh, Emma was getting at and what Keynes was getting at, we are more productive now than we've ever been. We've just got to stand back and say, we don't have to work as much as we do. And so the reference point for negotiating what we do at local level has got to be around a different set of parameters. At the moment, it is assumed that the, the kind of reference point for negotiation is five days, eight hours a day, but then um, because we've moved to working to task as opposed to working to time hours of balloon for, for many white collar workers in particular, so the thing I like about the four-day work week is it just radically shifts and it says, no, we're not going to take five days of the reference point. We're going to take four days of the reference point. And I think what you're getting at and what's been implicit in some of the questions is <clears throat> I'm strongly of the view that four days, the, the hours should come down with the days. You don't try and do 40 hours in five days. You want to have, you want to, the, the standard now, there's, we are more prosperous, pros, prosperous than we've ever been. We only need to work 32 hours. It's not a matter of trying to squeeze more into fewer days. And I think if you see, as John was saying, how do you distribute the gains of productivity? That's the way you distribute the gains of productivity. Necessary labour time comes down. So I think if you take that perspective, you sidestep a lot of those issues. If the reference norm becomes you should basically get your current salary with 20% less hours, that's a, that's a huge shift. And that allows you then to manage your pickup times with your children or whatever. So, but that is a shift. I think that's, and now I'd value Charlotte's views on this. It's a little unclear to me whether yeah. she's advocating a 32-hour work week or a four-day four day work week, because I think the hours question is also important. <clears throat> Absolutely. Look, look, I mean, you know, we, we, we would love the idea of a four-day week, and that's certainly the end goal as far as we're concerned. But we recognise the journey to that is where businesses learn how to reduce work time, but also how to focus in on productivity. And so therefore, you know, what so what the you know the program is is it's a bottom-up program. It's that you you ask your staff, how can we change the way that we work within and, and the way your job roles run so that you can do your work in less time? And what we have our research that is coming out for our US and Irish pilot, which is coming out at the end of the month. Um, so, you know, keep an eye out for that, people. But one of the things that has come out of that is that people's ability to do their jobs in less time is actually quite possible. There isn't this sense of people burning out because they're trying to squeeze a whole pile of more work into less time. They're actually just being much more productive with the hours that they have and they are doing their jobs more efficiently. And so, therefore... Um, actually, people feel like they have much more control over how they how their work day goes, and so therefore, you know, so it it is so not only are there all of the the the, the well being benefits that are obvious to pretty much anybody who can think about this, but there are actually those workplace benefits that aren't leading to the things that people are concerned about, and we aren't, we're definitely not talking about four days, forty hours being squeezed into four days. We, we want meaningful uh, reduction in time. Mm. And if we can get to a four-day week, that's great. That's certainly the end game. But the pathway to it might be just to so that we can get all these com complex ways that we work these days. And if you think about it, when we drop from 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 a seven day to a six day and then from six day down to five, our, our society and, and our workplace wasn't constructed as complex as it is now and um and you know and and we didn't operate in such the global market i mean you know anyone can have a global job these days because you're just a laptop click away from that mm -hmm. so how we manage the workforce moving forward will it be a four-day week that would be a oh. nice aim but at least having a reduced time work week is a good place to start on a more sort of mechanical notion of note of how things work, uh, the hourly you know, a reduction in hours for full time workers implies an increase in the hourly rate, so that that would automatically, in the way our workforce is organised, flow through to part time workers as a wage increase. Yeah, and if you if you were, if you are producing as much as you were on a forty hour work week, 
then your wage shouldn't go down because the benefit, the company's benefit remains. And so, the, you know, and as much as your technical contract is to provide a certain number of hours, actually what the, what the company wants from you is an output. And so therefore we're reframing how we value that contract and saying, I want this output. You give me the, you, you give me some time and I will pay you for that output in an appropriate way, which then also one of the questions is are people who are on a four day week um, needing to go up to full pay? Well, you know, there are some employers out there that need to really look at themselves. The gender issue is huge in this space. We all know that hire a returning mother. She's going to give you a whole job. Well, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, that's naughty. And and if you and, and I often when I'm speaking to women's groups and I ask women, you know, who's done a you know a four day week on an eighty percent package of women, and I go shame on you, because if you're a woman who has the ability to negotiate your job terms, then you have a responsibility to do that and to say, I want to be paid for what I contribute, not for the hours that I do it. And if you don't do that, then the person who's on the security gate or sweeping the floors at night is never going to get that. We, we can't provide the, 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 the equity in our workplace if we don't have those who have the power. And um, Emma, you can probably talk to this. Yeah, it's a critical point, Charlotte. I, th I think you know, that what you're referring to is that old joke that if you want, you know, ask any working mother what productivity means, they will most likely in Australia be paid for a three or four day week and they're producing just as much as they did in a five day week before they went on maternity leave and came back to work um, and that's that productivity issue and it's entirely possible um, and it is I you know when I took this job a few years ago I was I had a, a two-year-old at the time I started and was asked if I wanted to work part-time and I said no because I'll end up working full-time and being paid part-time um, I'll be paid full-time please and I will deliver certain outputs and that's the way we run per capita now we deliver on output on projects um there's no set hours for my team and i think that's really critical um but the the, the broader issue here is is the questions that we get you know that, that i'm seeing pop up in the q a are all because of the inbuilt assumptions that we have that work is about hours devoted not about output um, and as john says we really need to change that reference point before we make a difference here how one of the questions i often get is okay well this is fine for office workers right you've shown that office workers are only productive for two or three hours a day so they can produce more in the in in the 32 hours or four days a week what about teachers what about nurses what about retail staff what about anyone that interacts with the public or the customer and as john said the answer there is rostering it's about sharing work more evenly. Um, in Australia, we have a huge problem with in particular teachers and nurses and child, early childhood educators and aged care workers being completely burnt out because the amount of hours that they're required to work in our underfunded and under-resourced health and education systems are just too demanding. What we need to see is a reduction in hours and a greater sharing of those workloads. Um, Australia has a significant problem with around 45% of full-time workers want Wanting to work less and around 65% of part-time workers wanting to work more and a reduction in standard working hours with no loss of pay is a way of sharing labour and its benefits more evenly. John, I noticed there's some questions there about um, the risks of burnout and how do you make this work in sectors as diverse as education, hospitality, aged care and construction. Can I have a yeah, go? Yeah, please do, yeah. So the risk of burnout is very serious. There's absolutely no doubt about it. And that's what we've been talking about. You've, it's not just the, the days you work, it's the it's not just the days you work, it's the hours you work. And I think that's what we I think everyone on this call is saying we're keen to bring the hours down to, not just the days. So that's if you don't do that, things get really difficult. And even when you do do it, things get difficult. The French, with their Jospin reforms in the 90s, got their hours down and then work intensification problems became serious. So, you know, I went to a number of workshops where they were looking at that. So that is a good question and, and it's and we, we're not flipping it aside. It's something we'd have to be on the lookout for, but getting the hours down as well as the days would be the way to do it. The question about how would it work in sectors as diverse as education, hospitality, aged care and building and construction is good. And that's why when you're looking at these issues, you've got to think about 
not just developments at enterprise level, but you've got to look at developments at sectoral and occupational level. And if you take education, for example, if you move to this um, system in education system wide, you would probably have massive job sharing. So if kids go to school five days a week, then there'll probably be a whole lot of job shares. So you, I know my child, uh, my daughter had in third grade, had um, one teacher for Monday to Wednesday and then a uh, different teacher Wednesday to Thursday. Wednesday to Friday. Nine in grade one, yep. Mm. So these things are not, in, not difficult. They are, they are difficult, yes, it's not straightforward, but they are not impossible. And what the great achievement of Charlotte and, and her group is, is they're, they're changing the question. They're not saying, how do we get more out of teachers? They're saying, they're turning it around, they're saying, how can we have a working regime that is worth having? And then we fit everything else around that. And I think that's, that way of posing the question is the way to do it. And, you know, um, once we've got the questions right, we can find the answers. And I think that's the thing I like most about the four-day work gets the questions right. And I think, you know, just picking on teaching as, as an example, but it's, it's the argument is the same for any industry. I mean, if we got every single teacher in Australia uh, around the room to actually find, a, you know, to, to apply their minds as to how they might be able to reduce work time, but still provide excellent teaching, they would find that if you even gave them even the remote possibility that it would work. You don't, the bosses aren't the ones that need to find the solutions. This has always got to be bottom up. The people who are going to get the time will find ways to make it work. And if we only just empower them, but there are industries, there, there are people in, and there are um, school districts in, in, in the US doing four-day weeks. Mm -hmm. there, there are examples of four-day weeks in pretty much every single industry somewhere around the globe. And so what we are very keen to be doing with our pilot programs and with the community that we're pulling together, so we, we have a community of four-day week companies, even those who've not done our pilot program, is actually how do we share those ideas and how do we influence from, from, from this side of things? So therefore you can see that there's a restaurant chain in Madrid that's got four restaurants and they're doing a four-day week. And their, their, their um, owner says to me, you know, she says, I, I quote Andrew all the time. Andrew said, it was easier than I thought. But that was because she actually opened her mind to the possibilities. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's John's yeah. point, is that we just, this, yeah. we just have to open our minds. On the specific question of schools, I mean, there's, with lots of things, but particularly yeah, that's one, an assumption that, well, this is the way we've always done things that can't change. But when you look around the world, although although five days and two days is very standard, the length of the school year uh, and the length of the school day varies radically across across systems. So uh, if, if for example, we converged on uh, a uniform uh, long weekend every weekend on Monday, which uh, would be easier in some ways because we could get rid of a bunch of public holidays that are only there to give us long weekends, <laughs> uh, there's no reason we couldn't manage schooling in four days a week. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, if we look at what the universities have done, the number of number of contact hours uh, per student per, per student has dropped dramatically as we've squeezed more students through the system, and yet they still seem to manage to come out more or less educated. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure uh, the older people will say well, it was better in our day, but in fact uh, they've had to learn a lot of stuff, a lot more stuff. So. So I think, yeah, and the pandemic, I think, really showed that, that uh, in particular with respect to presentism, that yeah, having people there in the office is something which bosses instinctively think is a, is a vital and necessary thing. It turned out to be for large categories of workers totally unnecessary. So I think uh, this will take a lot of experimentation to see what works and what doesn't work. Uh, but I think uh, uh, we we managed to go from six days, six days to five and we can go from five as before. John, there's also been an important other couple of questions come in. Mm. First of all, how do you ensure quality? And I think mm. that's often the case with any change in, in working mm. structures. And I think this is where issues of peer review and um, uh, scrutiny by colleagues is, a, is an important way forward. So I don't think that could be, um, mm. uh, that's not an insurmountable problem. The, the, the most recent question now is an important one. What do you do about those who work in excess of 38 hours anyway? 
you know, this mm. issue. And, um, and this is a serious problem, particularly in places like Australia. And it, it was a problem for the French when they went for their 36-hour week, and it was a problem for the Swedes when they went for it too. The French and the Swedes had quite strong actions. The French actually had working time police mm. around to, to workplace car parks and took photos of number plates to check people who were busting working time norms. And in Sweden, I know they just locked up buildings and you just couldn't get access after hours. So, and, you know, they would get into IT systems. So you want to get to a point, I had a colleague who had a brother whose um, pharmaceutical company was an American and his pharmaceutical company was taken over by a Norwegian pharma company. When they went to their first big meeting in Oslo, the Americans were shocked and outraged that all the Norwegians got up and walked out the door at five o'clock. It was just like a cultural norm. And they said, well, you know, we're highly paid executives. We've got to put in big hours. And they said, well, we've taken over you. I think it's clear that we've got a working <laughs> regime that's compatible with uh, economic success. So I think before you get to the Norwegian point, you've probably got to have things like the French and the Swedes did to actually break cultures. But it's a good question because it's not going to be easily changed. That's why I say ultimately you've got to have collective institutions like unions and the states that actually intervene and change practice en masse. It's very hard for any one individual enterprise to get too far down the road of change here. And, you know, and on a company-wide level, I mean, I had one um, regional managing director who said, well, look, you know, I don't know how I would get down to a 32-hour work week because I know on average my people work 53. So I said to him, well, look, why wouldn't you just apply 180, 100 and try to get down to 40? You know, mm. for us to achieve this, we are all going to have to start working on it. And so, we, you know, we, we can't suddenly get to a 30 or 32 hour week, but we can actually start changing how we work in our individual businesses and how, as to John's point, what is our attitude towards that, change the norms about that. And I think in particular in, 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 in Emma's um, area, you know, how are we getting, you know, I, I talk about we've done a lot to pull women up in the workplace, but we're not as a society getting men enough opportunity to get out of the workplace. And so if we are empowering men to work less, then, then we just need to encourage them to use it for the time <clears throat> for, um, for, for care and, and household duties, the, the unpaid <laughs> unpaid work yes, it's that, not about an extra golf day as I like it's to say. a bit of a societal shift I'm being a gross generalization so do not if you're a male in the room get offended at all <laughs> but the, the, the research does tend to indicate that men do veer off here but that is changing the the the, the younger generations particularly have a much more equitable um, relationship with unpaid work um, and you know so our society is is changing and um, you know people say to me you know the young ones these days don't want to work as hard and I go well good because actually you know what we could learn from them yeah mm -hmm. can I can I make a point too and this may seem incendiary to some um, the question about the, well, the, the the anecdote that you shared there Charlotte of the the employer that said well my my staff work about 53 hours a week well unless he's paying them for 15 hours overtime uh, he doesn't have a viable business uh, and he doesn't mm -hmm. have a viable business model um, and there needs to be some point at which we say to certain employers and employer groups, um, you have confused the right to pursue profit, which is a, a natural part of a market economy, with the right to make a profit at any expense. Uh, and profits are important. They're, in, they're an important part of our market system. But we have to remember that what produces those profits is people. Uh, and so if there are businesses where people are working an extra 15 hours unpaid a week, uh, then the, the change norms around a four-day work week will of course, make that kind of cultural shift um, much more possible as well. But there will be an extent to which, uh, even though the the 180 model uh, 100 model is saying no loss of productivity, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that there won't be some shift in the relationship between profit share and wage share. Because we have to remember what we're effectively talking about here is wages in yeah. the form of time. Yeah. A, a quick point that uh, is. Uh, this pressure becomes much worse from, from the employer's point of view uh, when we have full employment. And so uh, we had a lot of talk of skill shortages and job shortages. Those are just full employment as viewed from the buyer's side. That, um, and if you look at the big progress, uh, yeah, the reason Australia and New Zealand got these, uh, got these things first wasn't because 
our workers were so much more brave and militant. It was because there were fewer of them, and employers could employers had to had to make deals if they wanted to get the work done. The same with the weekend. It came it came with the, with the return of full employment after World War Two. We have for once a, a position where where that's that's happening. We hope I hope we can keep it. And indeed, just when you look at the we look at the work intensification. The peak of it was in the 1990s, just after the big depression recession. Then workers have been clawing back some of that very gradually over the past 20 years, and now is the time to make a big advance. Um, I've managed to talk out the last minute or two, so I'll call that the wrap up. And uh, look, we've had a uh, a really big uh, turnout, I can see, and not too many people have left early. So I, I'm I'm really encouraged. I think uh, uh, these. Uh, uh, thought leadership seminars we've had some very good ones and and i certainly found this one worthwhile uh, so thanks everyone for coming and um if you have burning questions you want to want to reach uh, we're all all pretty findable by email so um uh, feel free to get in touch and, and ask us more uh thank, thanks again to rose and um Catherine for organizing everything uh, and hopefully we'll see you next time thank right. you very much everybody thank you thanks. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, you, Q. Mm -hmm.